What was your motivation uh, for writing this book? <laughs> One thing you need to know about me is before I was in USA, because this is an unexpected uh, detour in my career, I was an editor in Washington for a global news organizations. So I was a journalist. And as I was in the Valley, I'm like, this is a great story. Okay, so for, I have to tell you, first, it's a great story. And as far as I know, nobody had really written about it, or not, in, as, as Muhammad said, not in the in a, in a narrative non-fiction way that people would, you know, a lot of people would want to read about. And we had a, we had a great character. Otto Molica was a great character, and he and, and he, he he's never disappointed. And, and I had a great phone conversation with him when I was wrapping up the book, and I helped to see him in, in Ethiopia. Um, again, so it had ingredients for a great story, but also it was a so that's the journalistic, that's the storyteller's thing. But it was also a very important story in terms of human rights and the people involved who were some of the most famous indigenous peoples in Africa. And then on top of that, the World Heritage thing, which I didn't know a lot about when I was with USA, and I learned about more in the research for the book. And um, as you say, me, Leakey, uh, who I'm really pleased that you've worked with, I've been reading her book, and I, let me make sure you uh, you get a copy of this book as well, because this is a wonderful and amazing book. Her memoir of the important work she did with, with her husband, Richard Leakey, around Lake Turkana, and some of the work done in, in the Elma Valley um, by, by Richard Leakey as well. Um, so, motivation was great story, an important story the world needs to know about, because indigenous people uh, have not had their story told in the way it needs to be. It's often told in very tiny, kind of localized fashion, which is important too. But here's a story that has literally, the story of the Oma Valley now, it's literally shaped America's global policy on indigenous rights and development. Because the guy who wrote that, and he's in my book, Brian, I took him through the Oma Valley, and Brian continues to be highly interested in the Oma Valley. He was the indigenous affairs advisor to the head of USAID, America's first indigenous advisor on on development. He persuaded the Obama administration to support the United Nations Declaration. The U.S. had been on the sideline when it came out, but it went up for a vote under the Bush administration. Obama swung around, endorsed it, and also endorsed a bigger, a big expansion of dialogue with American Indians, American Indian tribes. So it's important, it's getting to be more important, and there's a whole emerging uh, context here of mineral resources, also for the green energy revolution, which is upon us, and uh, across the world in places where people literally have been abused, killed, abused, driven off their lands in order to get access to minerals, oil, or just the land itself. Uh, in Australia, two or three years ago, a major mining company blew up, destroyed a 46,000 year old sacred site of indigenous people, it led to the CEO quitting. There was so much pressure. So this is gonna become a bigger deal. It's important in Ethiopia's history too. I don't want to just make this a story about Ethiopia being the villain here because Ethiopia also was trying to develop resources that it had. And we were trying in dialogue with them to, tr to help them to understand that they've gotta do this the right way. They've gotta bring these people into the conversation and make them part of that development. I don't think that succeeded, honestly. I think because we're still seeing problems, we know it hasn't. But um, uh, it's super important for them and any, any group to have a say. It's ultimately going to result in a better development plan. It's going to create better conditions all the way around. And you're going to get out of this conflict situation, which unfortunately now I think, I think in for, for the long haul because of the way they've approached it. I want to read a little bit from um, uh, telling you something, a little, maybe a little more lighthearted, but it was something we faced every time we went into to the Omo Valley as international monitors. How are we going to communicate with these people? How many people in this, if we're going to go talk to the Mercy or the Bodhi, how many people can we count on that know enough English that we can have meaningful and accurate conversations with these people? So we thought, we got it, we figured it out. We, we're gonna go in, we're gonna to talk to the Mercy. Oh, we found this, these four young men and they're going to school all the way over at Arba Minch. There's no way the Ethiopian government knows about them. They're, they're not under surveillance. Yes, let's sign up these boys, we did. 
As our conversation with Molika wound down, as we were, we, our introductory con conversation, we brought out our aspiring translators. We wanted somehow to assure Molika and his lieutenants that our youthful assistants carried no political grudges to the table, only linguistic longings. An activist filmmaker we had used the previous year for translations had run afoul of Molika, and our boys would walk, or talk, excuse me, a neutral line. Stitching together the meaning of what we were hearing would be their sole interest. In retrospect, the boys needed to grasp only one meaning, meaning in this pitiful trade in tongues. We were hopelessly naive. The next morning, our vehicles descended the sun-kissed escarpment west of Jinka and began our trek across the Oma Valley through Mago National Park. Our translators had walked 12 miles, 20 kilometers, from their village to meet us. As emissaries to the world beyond the Elmo Valley, they carried a considerable cultural burden across an unimaginable chasm. Their styles reflected this fused worldview. One boy wore a modern shirt complemented by a lion's tooth strung around his neck from a big cat he said he had felt. Let's skip ahead a little bit. During our otherwise insightful visit, a discordant note emerged. Otto Molika had accompanied us west and took issue with a boy's translation of a Bodhi focus group. Bodhi being another pastoralist group. And he said that their translation, translation suggested that the agricultural Konso people were grabbing vacated Bodhi land. He was very upset about this. In village parlays or internet chatter, Molika placed great value on the words used to describe how the government dealt with the delicate Omo. Well, that night as we relaxed back in Jinka, which is the capital of the, of the Omo region, as we relaxed back in Jinka at a local watering hole after our long day, the unofficial leader among our translators approached us, timidly, in the red cycling jersey that he wore each day. I don't feel well, he said. It wasn't cow's blood that he couldn't digest because his people drink cow's blood for the protein. The long arm of the Ethiopian state had turned his stomach, according to his telling. The previous evening, only hours after we had introduced him to Molika and his team, the boys were visited at their hotel by two men who said they worked for the zonal administration. Don't cast the sugar project in a bad light through your translations, the men warned. These are foreigners that you're working for. You're Ethiopian. Ethiopia depends on their money. What to do? From a lodge outside of Jinka, Melanie, now I'm introducing Melanie here briefly. Melanie was our team leader. She was the head of British development assistance in Ethiopia at the time. Today she's the British ambassador to um, Zimbabwe. Melanie worked the phones to government ministers back in Addis, reminding them of their assurances that we could do our research without interference. Clearly, however, it would be foolish and perhaps dangerous to venture into mercy territory with these boys. Remember their, their mercy. Putting them and their families at risk of reprisals from the omnipotent government, government of Ethiopia. At 10.20 the next morning, we returned to Molika's office for a showdown and a getaway. Pause there. You can pick it up in the book later. But the issue of language um, is very important and continues to be, as there are very few who can, people who can translate for us, and you need to have those translators. The issue of education, as Mohammed was alluding to, also super important also becomes very critical to the story I tell in the book. Because education, among many things, can be the most sensitive thing you're pushing on a, another culture. They might forgive you for pushing on them some farm practice that's not familiar. Pushing on them some, uh, perhaps, way of language or saying you've got to you know, speak our language as well as your own. They might say, all right, we'll accept certain practices about how we go, you know, livelihoods. But our education of our kids, 
that's where they may draw the red line, as you'll see in the book, and I won't I'll let you kind of get into that in, in the book. Um, I'm going to skip ahead, if, 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 and we'll, we'll take questions uh, after this. I'm going to skip ahead to talk about the Hummer people. Now, the Hummer, the gentleman there in the red sort of plaid there that they, in one of our vehicles, um, is a is a Hummer man. He's uh, in the in the store you have in your seat as well. And just to kind of orient you very quickly, um, the Hummer are, are in the southwestern part of the valley. Think of the valley kind of as a rectangle, and the Hummer are down here, very close to the Kenya border. Uh, the Bodie and the Mercy we've been talking about are up here, very close to the sugar plantation. So they're kind of removed from the plantation. As you read the book, the plantation is one of Africa's biggest agricultural projects. It covers 100,000 hectares, 250,000 acres along the Omo River. But the Hummer are famous, probably the most famous of all the cultures. Why is that? The filmmaker and anthropologist Jean Liddell, who's British, and her husband, Ivo Strecker, who's German, they're the two principal anthropologists that have studied the Hummer people. And Jean has made films on them. She followed a woman named Duca and made a series of films about her life that were shown on the BBC in the 1990s particularly and were shown at festivals. Got so famous that the famous Hollywood newspaper, industry newspaper Variety, reviewed her films. They, they, they were that big. And she was kind of like doing reality TV before there was reality TV and, be, and it became just kind of ridiculous. Um, so she follows this woman, Duca, she, from her adolescence and as she grows into a woman. Um, so Jean uh, made the, really kind of made the Hummer famous. Evo uh, and his uh, studies have made the uh, Hummer famous, and I've had the privilege of hanging out with Evo and Jean, as you'll read in the book, and, uh, and learning from them. But I'm taking you to a Hummer village tonight as we wrap up. We uh, went in to visit this village, which um, was important because a, an American woman who made a fortune did quite well in Minnesota and a technology company. She spent her money, did trips, and then one day she's like, I've I got to do something different with my life. And she learned about the Hummer people in Ethiopia and went there and decided to start an NGO to help particularly the Hummer women learn skills and begin to um, have some kind of role in, in Hummer life. So we were there staying in this village and because we had been talking to the villagers because they'd taken us around um, we decided to to throw them a party which we did that night and that's what i'm going to describe you now it's chapter eight it's called a frontier closing impossibly distant suns pricked our cosmic ceiling with a startling clarity and profusion of a planetarium showed them none of the hushed all Drum beats and singing hurled heavenward as a throng of men and women jostled around a roaring fire. From my seated vantage point, through an undulating pack of sinewy torsos, I could detect bodies jerking upward like pogo sticks around the fiery inner glow. Airborne and joyful, this Hammer village had come together at our invitation and with our gratitude for gleefully enabling us to meddle in their affairs. Off to the side across a clearing, a smaller, equally intense blaze beckoned, tended by five men bent to their task, bathed in billowing warm hues. Dancing would not be dancing without the promise of feasting. As a gift to the village, our team had pooled $250 and purchased an unsuspecting cow. We checked that off our shopping list and stepped aside. Nimble hands, aided by night vision eyes, butchered the beast in the enfolding dusk. When the light vanished, I strolled over in the kinetic darkness to observe the Stone Age gourmands and their approach to outdoor grilling. Now, over at the edge of the exuberant crowd sat a middle-aged guy toting a beefy torso crowned by a sagging Boston Red Sox baseball cap. He entertained Hammer kids by flicking his lighted watch face on and off in the darkness his grin widening as their eyes bulged and sparkled. In no-tech country, a blazing wrist appeared to be the work of a visiting conjurer. And in his vast world, some may have thought so. Brian had ventured beyond the tangible specific now into the spirit territory of peoples tethered to a deep 
and otherworldly existence. Along Amazon waters, out under the stars of hunter-gatherers, or in the southern, or in the rainforest, among the rainforest tribes of Papua New Guinea, who are struggling to survive the invasive mining of gold, copper, and nickel. While quaffing a draft beer from a bar stool, Brian would marvel at these keepers of time, deep, of deep time, and the portals into fantastic worlds, stewards of land and sacred spaces, under threat from a brash, bustling, and impatient world. I'm going to end it, end it there. Um.